Oh, oh yes. Yeah, I just blasted full speed ahead on my AC <laughs> intentionally here uh, because I'm sweating bullets from this massive peep wave going around. But moving along, since I just previously reviewed speed, because I just picked up the 4K Ultra HD release just recently, because you already know the story, an LAPD cop was about to go after this um, crazy, psychotic, but a well genius um, bomb extortionist who's rigged the bomb inside the transit bus where you have to speed above 50 because if it drops below it will explode and he joins in the ride with another passenger named Annie Porter and there's no doubt about it it's one of the most awesome blockbuster action films ever made which features Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock both have terrific chemistry together as Jack Traven and Andy Porter and of course Dennis Hopper playing the psychotic villain you'll never forget awesome movie but now I'm going to be reviewing the totally forgettable unnecessary lackluster sequel to the original blockbuster that should have been standalone in the first place Speed 2 Cruise Control. This time Keanu Reeves did not reprise his role as Jack Traven. Instead he's being replaced by Jason Patrick as Alex Shaw who also works for the LAPD. But now Annie Porter who's played by Sandra Bullock have reprised her role only to discover that Alex is her new boyfriend. So, because, you know, he has been wasting his time doing all this uh, activity of taking out all the bad guys, you know, joining them with the SWAT team, while Annie is going around, you know, you know, getting her driver's license under bulk, that's why she had to take the test, they decided to go on a cruise to the Caribbean, where all of a sudden they meet a computer expert who's psychotic and he's the major villain of the story named Geiger who's played by William Defoe which his plan was to actually set off all these bombs because unfortunately we are supposed to feel a lot of sympathy behind this character because they kicked them out and now he's getting his revenge and that's why he's doing exactly what he wanted. Uh, whatever. It's hard to believe that this got green-lighted, to my dismay. But this is what happens when a movie this popular, you know, where it made directly for all the box office numbers around, because more audience want to see more blockbusters than ever before, the studio was just desperate, which of course, it's Fox, since they were the distributor for the first movie. They wanted another sequel, but John DeBont, the original director of the first movie, didn't even want one to begin with, and I don't blame him. Since I know Keanu Reeves made the right decision not to appear, I mean, mostly because he was uh, working on a band yeah, a rock band called Dogstar, which at that rate, um, he was taking a bit of a hiatus break from movies until he finally got uh, the choice uh, to replace uh, Will Smith for The Matrix, and which I know that movie came out in 1999. So yeah, Bullock didn't even want to do this either, but it was just part of her um, paycheck or at this rate her contract but I know they were going to get other actors to play the parts 
a valid straw if um, Reeves was not going to be available, so they had to rewritten this character. And the fact that they had to rewritten the story about you know how she broke up with him. Um, that's why they had to get Jason Patrick as a suggestion to uh, Sandra Bullock. Because they thought, why not? Maybe it might have the vulnerability as we did in the first movie, so that'll be the case for for him to be the hero. Which that is a shame because I love Jason Patrick. Uh, I always remember him in movies like The Lost Boys, but he was also in a movie called Rush from 1991 with um, Jennifer Jason Lee and Sam Elliott. Yeah which I know both him and, and her were, were playing undercover cops, you know, posing as uh, drug dealers so they can go after them. That's a great, powerful film. And I know he's went on to other films, too. Uh, I, I know he was in a film called um, Sleepers. He was in a movie called Narc, uh, among many others I could think of. But he's a terrific actor, but sad to say, he's not much of an action hero status. And that was the problem. Uh, William Defoe, as much as I love the actor, because he's been in a lot of great films, uh, such as Platoon, which I know he, he was nominated for an Oscar for his outstanding performance. And I know he went on to do films like um, Mississippi Burning, uh, White Sands. Uh, well, he was in a bad film before, too, called Body of Evidence with Madonna, which I know Joe Mantegna was in that one. I feel bad for him to be in that one, too. I, well, I felt bad for all the other actors. <laughs> and even Ann Archer was in that. One too. But he, he had a lot of great films, um, uh, like Light Sleeper. Well, he's great at playing villains too, but this is this is not the best villain that he had to choose. I mean, considering that this was totally generic. But if you ask me, I would rather take the Green Goblin and Spider-Man over this character. That's for sure. And the plot doesn't make any sense. I mean, what was the purpose of actually having a cruise as you speed up twice as fast as a bus is really impossible and I've been on a cruise before too yeah I mean come on I went to the Princess Cruises back in 2001 and I know for the fact that it's not that fast it's very slow but it could speed up but not exactly in the same speed as a bus. Yeah. And I know it's going to sound pretty embarrassing because I met uh, Jason Patrick uh, back in 2014 and 15, but maybe I shouldn't be embarrassed because he's, a, again, a great actor. And he's very nice. It was great to see him. I mean, hell, he even... <laughs> helped me actually uh, film something for my camera right there uh, when when I was uploading it um, onto my Facebook page uh, where you saw or at this rate YouTube where you saw me and and uh, Mia when we were at uh, Matania's place you know celebrating her birthday yeah, it was fun so basically the story here was was part of the idea of what Devont wanted which I know he didn't really want, was that it was based on an idea where he actually had a recurring nightmare on a cruise ship that crashes into an island and that's exactly how the climax turned out to be. Oh yeah, and did I mention that uh, Roger Ebert as well as Gene Sisko, yes Sisko and Ebert themselves actually defended this film and gave it two thumbs up Considering the fact that all the critics nationwide, well, maybe a few, actually hated the film so much that they 
critically panned it all from head to toe. I mean, no wonder. It was a dumb idea. Why would people want to see this? That's exactly how we all felt. <sighs> well, I still think Babin and Robin is a lot worse. I mean, at least for me, there are some nice shots. I mean, it does have the, the perfect cinematography, and it did have some wonderful music. I mean, it's basically reggae songs, such as UP40, among other ones. Um, and it did have, like, a basically a Caribbean uh, version of the speed theme, so I'll give you that. I mean, with the help of Mark Lucina, who's the composer of the original film. And all the other shots were pretty well done, but other than that, though, it's pretty bland and boring. Not, not exactly as thrilling as I thought it was going to be, but it should have been. But anyway, let's get right to this mess. It stars Sandra Bullock, Jason Patrick, William Defoe, Tamara Morrison, Brian McCarty, Jeremy Hotz, uh, Bo Swenson, Royal Watkins, Tamia, yes, Tamia, the uh, the Canadian uh, singer and songwriter, she's an actress, uh, Kimmy Robertson, Christine uh, Ferkins, uh, Lois uh, Chills, Francis Gonan, Michael G. Haggerty, yes, the same man who was in Overboard, the original film. Yeah, he was a comedian too. He's been in like several other films in his career. It's amazing that he actually winds up in this one because you're expecting he was going to fall overboard. <laughs> uh, Colin Camp, who I know have been in a lot of stuff too. I mean, of course, she was in. Um, Clue. Uh, she was in other comedies. Yeah, the Police Academy movies too. Yeah. Joe Morton from the first movie. And I know he was in Terminator 2, among others. Tim Conway, yes, the legendary comedian who's no longer with us, sadly. Um, but I know he's been in shows like. Mikhail's Navy, uh, The Carol Burnett Show, uh, The Dwarf Series, among many others he's done. I mean, he's a legend. And I really miss him. And Glenn Plummer, also from the first movie. It was nice to see him again as Maurice. And I know he went on to do Strange Days, and he went on to do the TV show ER as well as Son of Anarchy, among others. It's written by Randall McCormick, Jeff Naperson, uh, along with John DeBont. Yeah, based on his particular one story. And of course the film itself being based on on the original script by Graham Yost, where it had the rewrite by Josh Wheaton. And it's directed by Jean de Bont. By the way, I just revisited this mess on HBO Max. The first one's available, by the way, but since I already own the 4K one, I'm fine with that. Along with the DVD and Blu-ray. You know. I'm sure as hell wouldn't pick this up on either DVD nor Blu-ray if I had to. I mean, unless I had to spend like maybe 50 cents or maybe a dollar or two or three, I don't know, at my local Goodwill or whatever store I have to find, I don't know. But it, it ain't gonna be pretty, <laughs> especially when I'm reviewing this right now. But here we go. The movie begins in another typical day in LA, California, where we meet an LAPD officer, Alex Shaw, played by Jason Patrick, who's uh, speeding on a motorcycle chase, going after this one criminal who's driving 
a truck filled with stolen goods. You know, all these packages are flying around in his path. Yeah, you know, especially when he drove around speeding directly into the cliffs. When he finally uh, catches the driver, yeah, just rolling down up, up from the hill and got him. His girlfriend, Annie Porter, as you may remember her from the first movie, played by Sandra Bullock, just once into him during her driver's test, just so she can get her license on revoke. Uh, where she's with uh, driver's ed teacher, Mr. Kenter, played by Tim Conway, you know, poor guy. I mean, is this is the way to treat a comic legend right there, where he's basically, you know, trying to... T explain to her about all the all these directions that she's supposed to take meanwhile she's just going around you know you know speeding up not paying attention to the road you know almost causing a, a collision towards you know pedestrians and and vehicles around you know making all these accidents and almost almost nearly you know going out down to these speed bumps and all that and down the hill and all while she's just speeding up her mouth you know talking way too much she found out that Alex was on the SWAT team the same team that um, that Jack Traven was on and that's where he got to meet Lieutenant Heard uh, Mac McMahon who's played by Joe Morton, who looks quite different than what he looked uh, in the first movie. He's now bald. He does have a goatee. It's like, I never even knew that was him. <laughs> well, he had to confess with Annie that he did lie, and he told her that he was a beast officer. So, to make it up for the apology, he surprises her with a Caribbean cruise on Seaborne Legend. Yeah, two tickets. And once they finally aboard the ship, that's where we get to see this deranged, sympathetic uh, passenger named John Geiger, who's played by William Defoe, who was a former employee of the cruise company. Basically, he's a computer expert himself because he hacks into the ship's computer system yeah already setting up all the bombs directly through those golf clubs and, and a golf ball oh and by the way he also brings in his uh, his entire glass jar of his favorite pets um, leeches yeah I say more so that means you know that he has to put leeches uh, over his body so that way they could feed all the blood because it has copper poisoning inside so now you know if he does his job the leeches could do theirs <laughs> disgusting I know anyway he sabotages the ship's communicating system and kills Captain Pollard who's played by Paul Swenson yeah, by knocking him overboard, uh, hitting him with the, the lamp. And after um, remotely shutting down the ship's engine, Geiger calls the bridge to tell the first officer, Polano, who's played by Tamara Mortison, um, that Pollard is dead and he's going to be in charge to take over under Geiger's orders to which means that he's going to tell him to have every passenger on board to evacuate the ship because it is going to cause a warning for that where he's going to set up all the bombs they put directly into the rooms yeah well both Alex and um, Annie were just you know spending time you know, playing games, you know, having fun, you know, they they went dancing, you know, having a dinner. Uh, they actually made contact uh, with this one uh, deaf girl named Drew. 
uh, is played by uh, Christine uh, Ferkins, uh, joined with uh, her mother and father, um, Celeste and Rupert, both played by Lois Chills and Francis uh, Dynan. Um, so, well, with at this rate, Drew pretty much sort of has a has a bit of a crush on Alex. But considering the fact that she's way too young for him, that it's never going to be. But once disaster already hits, now they're already being trapped inside, and they're about to uh, escape from another boat so they can evacuate as soon as possible. But unfortunately, that was going way t out of control because one of the half of the other passengers fell off of the boat since. You know, one of them didn't quite fit to that one boat, and now they died. And Alex, on the other hand, was trying to help them out, trying to save one. And then next thing you know, he was about to find where Drew is at, which at this rate, Drew wants to be stuck in the elevator. And she's trying to find a way to get out of there, and until so Alex finally saved her life. Meanwhile, um, the other uh, passengers are already stuck inside the room where all the air vents are filled with sulfur that's spreading around. They had to take off all their clothes, they had to cover them up so you know, all that sulfur will not knock them out. And yes, uh, there's even one singer around, uh, Sherry Silver, who's played by Tamiya, which at this rate we reveal that she has no underwear. <laughs> I wonder why. Which Here's another thing too. This movie is PG-13, and it's like, yeah, they knew they were gonna go for something for this um, almost uh, crassy right there. Like, yeah, let, let's let's just throw that into the plot here. Like, like this is gonna be funny, or like this is gonna be sexy or something like that. But that's not gonna happen. And well, of course, there are gonna be some few swear words here and there, but. Granted, it's not going to be something as gratuitous or something a lot stronger in, in the speed, but whatever. I mean, so, so of course, there's no gratuitous sex in this movie. Boy, it sure is begging for something. <laughs> I don't know. So they all got stuck in there, and then Andy decided to take out the chainsaw to open up the doors so they could have them escape as soon as possible. Then the entire ship starts to uh, sink in and then rising up the ocean water level. Um, there's actually one black guy uh, named Dante who's played by Royale Walters who just goes around bringing his precious camera, you know, taking every snapshot no matter what situation they're at, you know, they you know, they take a lot of snapshots at the crews and, you know, the couples and everyone around. Um, he does come around to help uh, Annie, you know, try to get all the equipment so they can try to get him out of there. And then, of course, he does help out Alex, um, you know, turning up the knob to start the propellers. Oh, and while they're swimming around, too, uh, during that particular scene, um, before everything had happened and, and now Alex uh, had took Drew directly to the parents so now they're all about to go directly into the the next uh, area where they'll be safe well Alex is about to go after Geiger and unfortunately he's already setting up uh, some more traps he just put in a C4 grenade uh, stuck inside the door which has been shut off you know Alex was about to grab the shotgun to shoot him to go after and, and now he was stuck with all these other explosives being thrown into him and then uh, which is somewhere inside the, uh, the gift shop so when uh, Annie and and Hulando actually came by to, to save um, Alex, I mean, they are trying to tell Andy to actually try to take uh, the grenade out. And once they did, uh, that's where 
he opens the door and now he can finally get out of there as soon as they can and try to explain to him about you know, what Geiger just did here and now he's going to take over to actually to, to actually stop the boat as soon as possible which at this rate you know Geiger's plan was you know he's going to escape and then he's just going to be able to set everything up for grabs to you know pretty much destroy the ship and even worse the ship was going to speed up all the way directly into another ship but they had to find a way to actually uh, turn it over before you know that crashes but much worse than that they're about to crash directly into an island where you see a bunch of speeding boats and, and other kinds around and I mean crashing up towards a lot of uh, you know innocent victims around and and then the boat basically takes like, well, pretty much like 15, um, yeah, 15 totes just speeding all the way down so, while wow, it just keeps crashing all the way straight into the island. Yes, it's crashing so many buildings around, all, all these other um, condos and other uh, places around too. I mean, there's even this... Uh, one kid who uh, joins with her mother to actually move in, but I know that's going to crash. And then next thing you know, uh, there's this one guy who actually has a black car, which is almost similar to the uh, the Jaguar that you saw in in the first movie. Wow, this is really starting to troll the audience here. Where at this rate, just when the the ship finally made it stop. You know, they try to stop it with the anchors, and that didn't work out. They try to do everything they can to stop this boat. No tries. Uh, there's even uh, a scene where, well, before that, um, uh, Alex had decided to go all the way down, you know, with, um, with the, the swimming gear to actually try to stop the propellers. And so that way the, the boat will stop, but that didn't work. And at this rate, uh, Geiger eventually took uh, Andy hostage. So now, you know, they're both speeding up directly for these uh, the jet skis. I mean, luckily, Andy escaped before Geiger continues to go on. While, wow, you know, Geiger also has his money and stuff. Well, anyway, uh, but back to the ship, <laughs> as it already just made a full stop. Um, it had, the anchor um, already had broken off, but the second anchor was already stuck, and then suddenly it drops directly into the car, just when this one dog, uh, who was just running around, wants up hiding inside that car. I mean, the guy was just at 7-Eleven, you know, just getting some, you know, food and stuff, and drinks, and then he's just very shocked that his car got destroyed, but the dog lives. <laughs> Oh, but then suddenly, Maurice was there with his girlfriend, and Alex eventually just decided to uh, borrow the speeding boat uh, from him. So now, this is where we get to this speed chase scene between Alex and Geiger, and you know, with Annie on board too, and. And when she escaped, um, Geiger was going to chase after her, which Geiger did went after Andy again, and they decided to take all the way off to a this one plane, and Alex was about to go after them while hanging on to, uh, by shooting the, uh, the spear gun so they can go all the way on top of, so he can go all the way on top of the plane through the pontoon. And then, once he got um, Annie out of there and also punches uh, Geiger, <laughs> um, both uh, Alex and Annie escape, while Geiger, already you know on the plane, wants up going straight to the top of the same ship that they were going to crash on. 
while everyone out there had escaped and it was ready to explode. And yes, Geiger had died along with the rest of the ship. So it had a really big explosion. So now both Alex and Annie are together. He finally gave her the gift that she didn't expect it, but she did. So now they're both together. Which leads to the end of the movie where now Annie one more time decided to take another driving test. And guess what we spot at the end? Yes, the same transit bus from the first movie. Like, oh, not again. <laughs> oh, brother. Such a stupid film. I mean, from beginning to the middle, all the way to the end. Uh, the pacing was incredibly slow, sluggish. Not well done, as it seems. Uh... It got completely bland. Uh, Sandra Bullock was totally wasted as Andy. I mean, I, I, I love her better in the first movie, and, and I really don't blame Bullock for hating this film so much that she almost wished she never had been in this film in the first place. Jason Patrick deserves better. You know, as much as I love the actor, it just sucks that he, you know, he had to be stuck with a a pretty bland performance that I've seen coming from him. And it's too bad, because the script doesn't give him any favors. And as for William Defoe, his villain is totally over hammy, uh, cringe-inducing, and a complete generic villain that I just had no sympathy of. And I really didn't care about anything else in this ridiculous film except for the climax um, and the cinematography and the music. I'll give you this though, I mean it did have some incredible stunts. I mean even some wonderful shots of how the ship tries to move around and they try to find a way to, to stop it or maybe they, or the fact that it kept on going without any stops, I mean, and the, the total destruction of of all these speed boats and other boats around and and how it crashes into the the island with a lot of destruction is well done. Um, even the explosions and some of the action scenes, but that's it. I mean, they're, they're just, any, there's nothing special about this. It was a dumb concept it should have never been green lighted, but I could see why they did this because Fox was desperate to have another summer blockbuster up their hands and up their sleeves, and they just thought, okay, let's just let's give it to them. But that wasn't exactly the perfect start that they had in mind. It's like hard to believe that even though Fox at the time, along with Paramount Pictures, was actually working on Titanic. With James Cameron, you know, it's funny because originally that was supposed to come out during the summer, which it would have made more sense if it had came out uh, maybe during June, which happens to be the, the same release date as this film. But I guess they didn't want to go for any competitions. But if you ask me, Titanic at least had better special effects, and the fact, even though it's not exactly an action movie, it's more of a romantic drama, at least the scene where, where the Titanic hits the iceberg and it starts to break apart was well done. I mean, and they also have mixed in with CGI right there. As for the effects in this movie, I mean, it was done by women and who's, the same people that did Ghostbusters, so some of the effects are okay, mainly decent, but but at times it can be pretty adequate. So hey, what can you do? But whatever the case, this was a bomb. I mean, they spent like over 
110 all the way through 160 million dollars that they wasted completely I mean that's half of the amount that they that they spend directly from its particular budget a particular box office uh, budget from which I know speed was only 30 million I mean they basically just took the money that they just gross on and this is what we got and unfortunately it only made uh, 164.5 million which yeah it's it really did sink <sighs> whatever uh, this movie just makes me felt completely seasick and I know I've been seasick before when I was on the cruise and ah oh, whatever but this movie does make me seasick already and it wasn't really easy uh, with that is said, um, I can't believe Cisco Niebuhr to defended this mess. I mean, all this time, you know, they shit on North, which I would rather watch that than this, you know, for the comedy and the story. They even crap on my favorite movie, Good Burger and Heavyweights. And I had a lot of character development, an excellent story, and it was very funny, better than anything that this film really had. Okay. But, I know, I know. You know, it's, it's subjective. You know, action, comedies, um, romance, drama. Uh, musical, any other kinds of genres are subjected on their own ways for their own merits. It's understandable. But I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> so, if you ask me, you'd just be better off watching other blockbusters that came out in 97, like Men in Black, Face Off. Yeah, that's a way better film than this. There's a speeding boat in that film. I mean, God. Well, whatever. <laughs> Hell, I mean, even the fifth element is way better than this. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank goodness this movie bombed at the box office. And I'm so happy that it did one for worst remake or sequel category. As it's been nominated for eight Golden Rest. Berry Awards, yeah, the Ratsies, yeah, but it could have won even more though, How? but if it wasn't for Babin and Rob, <laughs> yeah, and let's hope they never make another sequel like this again, hell, not even a remake either, okay, okay, but if you ask me, man, just stick to the 1994 original film with Keanu Reeves, Sandra Bullock, and Dennis Hopper. Because you'll still have a fun time when you watch it again and again and again. And you'll never get tired of it. Especially in this generation. But this sequel can sink for all I care. So that's Speed 2 Cruise Control, and I give the film one star. Only one. But close to zero. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later, much later. Bye.